Thanks, Jillian, and welcome everyone. Sorry, just had a quick challenge with the mute here. Frank, you're on mute still, by the way, just in case you wanted to speak out. Um, so thanks for coming to our chat today. Um, we've got a lot of co content to cover, so we're just gonna jump right into it. Uh, we've got three areas that we're gonna talk, talk to, three general areas of the, 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 the session today. Uh, first, we're gonna frame the conversation a little bit around the crisis and recovery um that we are currently undertaking and then we're going to go right into the five ways to find cash fast and we're going to do end the things off with a little bit of a demo and q a and frank maybe just a, a quick word from you before we get started uh introduce yourself have a quick sound of your voice for everyone yeah certainly so uh frank campana managing director with cbiz risk and advisory uh cbiz risk and advisory is a national internal audit outsource group for cbiz um, we do three main things, which is internal audit and SOX, uh, data analytics, and cost recovery. And beautifully, this fits in cost recovery and data analytics uh, is the segue right into this. Our relationship with Galvanize is, is one of a strategic partnership. Uh, we, we use the ACL uh, Galvanize robotics platform um, exclusively, and we support that through, uh, to our clients. And that's really what we're going to talk about, how robotics can uh, help you find cash fast. Great. Uh, that's a great, uh, great start. And just before we get into the meat of how you would go and find cash fast, I got a question for you, Frank, and maybe some of the folks on the line as well to think about was, when was the last time you looked through your credit card statements to weed out any old uh, subscriptions and things that you didn't need anymore? Um, well, being a prudent accountant, I do that somewhat regularly. So um, it is funny though, because in April I did look back and noticed all of the ten to twenty dollar continuous charges I was getting, and uh, you know Netflix, Spotify, PlayStation Plus for my kids, all these things. But the one that really stuck out was I have this old iPhone Seven, and I've been paying insurance on it since, and I just found this in April. I've been paying insurance on it for six years, so I've been paying. <laughs> $15 a month of leakage in my own uh, uh, bills for multiple years. Yeah, same here. We I've reviewed our <clears throat> subscriptions and things. Turns out both me and my wife had Amazon Prime memberships and that's just a double dip. Um, so I think, you know, given the pre present, you know, crisis and, and crunch, um, it's a good idea, not just for individuals, but I think a lot of organizations are looking at the same um, challenge themselves. And, 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 and really trying to, to save cash and, and, and address uh, leakage any way that they can. Because one duplicate invoice, one, one fraud that comes up that, that, you know, so that is embezzling or, or misappropriating assets, each one of them means maybe another family doesn't have to lose their livelihoods because, um, because you don't have to let someone go. And so, so it's super important, both from a, a from a financial and operational, as well as a moral imperative for organizations to, to make sure that they're not leaking funds out to fraud, error, or abuse. Anything else yeah. to add there, Frank? Well, yeah, just the, the, a couple things as we're talking for, for everyone to kind of keep in mind is, you know, it could be as little, again, as $15 a month, but aggregate against your entire organization turns into millions of dollars, especially when you talk about over years, or it could be something as, as sneaky as a fraud, which could be millions of dollars in one instance. So yeah. there's just so many different ways, hopefully we could give ideas to help today. Great, so that's a good segue into maybe asking the audience to pull, um, essentially how often, when was the last time you checked your um, old credit card transactions to clean out old subscriptions. Um, so we'll leave that on the on the screen there for just a few seconds, and and feel free to answer at, at your at your will. And and we won't stop the the presentation to to go over the answers right now. But um, there's lots of lots to cover. So let's get started. Um, five primary ways to get find cash fast. There's obviously more than these five ways, but um, I thought we'd um, focus on these five for our presentation today. Number one is of course duplicate payments. Uh, we're going to talk about freight overcharges and shipping. We're going to talk about kickbacks and fraud, software licensing and pricing outliers. But let's take a look at that uh, duplicate payments issue because that's that's what a lot of folks start with. 
And when we have conversations with customers, I mean, inevitably your CFO or your controller will say, hey, we've got this under control. This doesn't happen in our organization. And it happens. The reality is uh, there's situations like this on the screen where you have your, your, your migrating systems, you have legacy systems, you get a duplicate payment because you charge one in one system and it ends up in the other system. You think you have automated controls or processes in place, but still, uh, stuff slips through the cracks. Um, and Frank, any anything else to add to this? This, uh, this well, talk? it was yeah. When we were talking about this yesterday, you you had mentioned, you know, do I see this a lot? And I, I will tell the the audience here, we do. I don't know. I'd say somewhere between ten and twenty accounts payable audits per month, and not including our continuous monitoring clients who are on this. And I will tell you, we are ninety nine percent out of every job we do, we find duplicate payments. So you've got to remember almost anyone using Oracle and SAP and all the, the big uh, um, ERPs, probably any ERP by this point has, you know, duplicate payment, you know, same invoice number. But when you apply real um, t uh, tests that take it one step further and deeper, it is almost impossible based on just the amount of, of you know, the AP clerks have so much on their plate trying to get through just dozens and dozens of these invoices and putting them in. It is almost impossible to do without software. Yeah, and that's great. Advanced that's great. Software. Yeah, like I've done um, dozens, if not hundreds of engagements um, on AP, on data analytics over the last, you know, 12, 13 years. Um, and every single time we have found like a real duplicate, something, you know, yes. we, we found obviously flagged potential duplicates. But when the customer went and looked at it deeper, they, they, they found real dollars here. Every and single, and, the, fun, and, the, that's and the fun of it is when a client uh, will say they don't need it or they don't, you know, nothing's going on and then they duplicate pay you. So yeah. <laughs> it's kind of proof, proof of concept. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, we, we mentioned that this can still happen even with real controls in automated controls in place in the ERP. But here's a couple of scenarios that can occur. So, um, Here's one situation where you have two different invoices to two different vendors. So that wouldn't be caught using most ERP controls, but they have the same tax ID. They have different names, um, you know, same date, same amount, but different tax IDs. Oh, sorry, the same tax ID. So are these really maybe the same, maybe they're the same entity. Maybe they've been, you know, plugged in twice into the system, but this, this occurs. I mean, you get, you get an invoice in and the AP clerk doesn't type in the name right. And they, you know, they say, oh, they're going to create a new vendor for it. So that can happen. Um, another scenario here is that, you know, you've got two invoices with two different vendors with the same phone number. So on and on, you can look at these different scenarios and, and combinations, and you can identify these invoices using a constellation of duplicate invoice tests. And uh, we've, we've accumulated this over these over the, the past, you know, dozen, you know, 15, 30 years of experience. Um, and the other important key consideration here is not to overlap your results. Because the last thing you want to do is find duplicates of duplicates and have your AP team have to review the same duplicates again. Um, so having these um, lined up in, in a way like this is, is great because then you only get the same duplicate flagged once. Frank? Uh, no, I'm just the only thing I guess I would add is, you know, depending on how the strength of your internal controls, a lot of times what happens as well is, is you may have uh, what you think are controls in place that would keep you from entering a duplicate uh, vendor, et cetera. But if the controls can be compromised, for instance, I'll give a quick example, you know, uh, your AP clerk's putting in an invoice that is, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and they actually put uh, one, two, three, uh, five, four, or, or even better, the, the company name is ABC and they put ABC dot. Well, it flashes up and says no uh, vendor and they have the ability to overwrite that and add a vendor. So now uh, they pay ABC dot vendor and then they call and say, hey, we didn't get our payment. And they look under the real vendor. Well, they didn't pay them. So then they make the payment because they uh, paid obviously the wrong vendor. So um, there's a, the controls are big this is a, a big part of the control environment as well. Yep. Yep. Super, super critical. And, and a lot of organizations, once they've done this testing, will turn it into a real set of detective controls for SOCs purposes or, um, or other, other controls or con compliance purposes as well. So here's a question number two for the 
uh, folks out there on the line is what's your current control or primary control for mitigating the risk of duplicate payments? Uh, are you relying on your ERP? Are you doing a manual review? Um, are you doing using a cost uh, recovery services firm? Or are you doing analytics and continuous monitoring? We always oh, recommend using a cost recovery firm just for the record, so. <laughs> of course, <laughs> and we would recommend that you always use data analytics to do your, there you go. <laughs> your testing as well and controls. So uh, on to case number two, freight overcharges. Frank, you wanna talk a little bit more about what freight overcharges means? And yeah, uh, certainly. So it, it's, it's interesting because when we speak to a lot of our clients, it seems like a pain point for everyone, but they just, they don't know really what to do, or they have a software that's cumbersome. Um, robotics really is something that we've developed to um, take a lot of that pain away. And if you have the galvanized system, it's something you can employ on your own and save that expense. But a quick uh, case study, we, we uh, were doing a freight audit for a large fork uh, care company, uh, products company. And what we were doing is reviewing their freight spend to, you know, it's always about, you know, is there inaccuracies or unrealized charges in there? So you, what you would basically do is pull in all the, the small parcel UPS, FedEx uh, and, uh, data, which you can get, you have into the system. And as we plugged in the contract rules, we started to notice obviously some anomalies and what's beautiful about this is you literally get super granular on the audit it, it's a per package audit this is not you know an, uh, an overall or just a monthly thing this is per package uh, per charge and what we found in this particular example is that when the uh, small parcel vendor sent their person to look at the size of the box they got it wrong and then you know the client just kind of went along with what they said and for a couple of years they were charging them for the wrong size box and it was pulled out by the data analytics um, because when we entered the rules of what they should be paying for it showed their size box was different than what they should have been paying for and we were able to go back and recover for two years a very large sum but along that same time, because you have all the rules in again, you start noticing some things like it added in fees and outside of contract fees, fees that were, were negotiated away. And, you know, again, AP clerks get a bill and they, they pay it. So it wasn't even noticed. They just didn't have the people or the bandwidth to get to that granular of level. So the, what you need to do is not, I mean, there's no individual that could catch everything, but the robot does. It's, you know, as long as you have the, the uh, scripts written properly and you have the, the input, the contract rules in, you get all of that. Um, so again, in this next slide, what you see, what, what we do in our approach is we're gonna review, review your freight contracts and what you wanna do is make sure that all these little uh, line items are checked, you know, shipping delivery dates. Um, an example is, you know, you send a package out for early morning and uh, as you all know, it's very expensive, but it arrives after noon. Well, those are two different uh, cost structures. The analytics will pull that out and it will automatically uh, enter into your monthly report or as often as you want it. But amounts and rates, but uh, weights and sizes, how big is that in, in, uh, in freight, uh, in small parcel freight? You know, a package that is, a small package could weigh, you know, two times as much as another one. So getting the weight done properly and the size of the box obviously matters. But then another thing is if you're an organization with multiple locations, depending on where your, uh, your shipments are coming from, that's an, a, yet another uh, um, source spot. So when you think about it, one analytic is going to give you multiple results for different uh, rules that can be broken. So what we want to do in, in the way we set up our fraud uh, or freight detection is to recalculate these charges and at the end of the month, pop out a report automated and sent to you via email, then it'll show you all the overcharges for the month. Now, all of a sudden, instead of spending all this manpower trying to look and dig into this detail, you receive this, and again, we'll talk later about 
a storyboard where you could get this actually in your dashboard, but or a, a report that is emailed to you. So at the end of the month, you call up your your FedEx guy and say, "Hey, I've got a report here, and you, you know you owe us some credit for five thousand bucks for all these misapplied charges." And this becomes continuous monitoring, and that's a big part of what we as a firm like to do, and Phil and I have talked about this, is to deliver a, 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 a solution that becomes a continuous monitoring solution where you could then have that on a regular basis. It's not about looking back multiple years. Now it becomes a one month at a time, very easy to manage. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really good. And and you, you mentioned that there was a there's an organization that saved over one point two million dollars annually based off of their freight audit. Yeah, I mean it is, and it's another thing, Phil. I, I I'll sound like a broken record through this entire uh, presentation. Oh, nothing worth speaking about that where there's a lot of transactions. There's never an engagement that we come back with zero. And I know you know that too. You guys do the same thing. This is. What ends up happening is your robotics platform completely pays for itself, and it's true, and not just in time for staff, but in returns. So, so good. Um, so, 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 so far, what we've talked been talking about are things like errors and omissions. I mean, maybe FedEx and UPS and other shipping companies are are, are making um, making issue errors and 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 omissions and and, and so forth like that, but. We're going to pivot the conversation a little bit to where you have intentional kickbacks and, and fraud occurring in the organization. And that's a little bit more insidious, a little more difficult to detect. So we're going to talk about a couple of different ways that we can use the power of analytics to find kickbacks and fraud. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Here's one example where an organization found that there was an employee who was essentially funding their child's Harvard tuition through their accounts payable uh, by submitting their invoices to their AP. And you think this is a pretty, a pretty confident thing to do, um, but it happens. I mean, if you've got someone who's pretty senior up in the organization who knows that their invoices, like you said, the, the clerk just pays it, um, then that can happen. And how this was found was through a keyword search for uh, the keyword of tuition. And so this organization, when they found that, oh, hey, they were paying, paying Harvard tuition in our AP, that doesn't make any sense. So then they, they were actually, um, they, you know, they, they made the, the correction and added additional keywords as well. So they went and, and grabbed all of the, um, all of the local and uh, uh, the local private schools to, um, to load into their keyword search um, to find if there was any other private, private school tuition. Thankfully, there wasn't. But... Um, Nonetheless, it highlights a, a, a useful tool when it comes to data analytics. And, and Frank, any other anything else to add around the keyword yeah, searching? Yeah, yeah. So keyword search is a, is another place where um, we do a lot of data analytics. So you know, a lot of companies and organizations think the only place you really use this is in in the financial realm of what we do or internal audit, if you will. Um, we have a client that does aftermarket warranty. Uh, services on computers, you know, when they're out of, of warranty and, and your computer maker doesn't want to continue, they pick up. So they asked if we could do a compliance audit for them. And their attorney was, was a little bit worried that there was a liability that they may be providing these, their customers um, uploads and uh, um, firmware and different things like that, which is not what they're allowed to do. They don't own that. So what they asked us to do, and I think they were doing it without noticing or even knowing that what they were allowed and not allowed to do, even though it was against policy. So what they asked us to do is a multi-level search, again, on keywords. But what's beautiful about it is you could do keyword search and then add on and add on and add on, which allows you to continue to eliminate at different levels so you don't come back with a subset and then do it again and then keep going. Um, it only gives you the level of, of indexing that you ask for. But what we were able to do is millions and millions and millions of lines of notes that the service engineer in the, in the field would type in, review these notes, and pop out the, the very few instances where it said firmware and uploads and all these different things. 
But what we were able to do for them is provide an assurance, a confidence level, if you will, of 96% that they were not doing that. So it gave them the, the compliance that made them feel comfortable and that they could, you know, their attorneys felt like, okay, we got this under control. But I guess going long-winded, this is just another example of all the many things you could do outside of necessarily financial. Yeah, yeah. Compliance is a huge use for keyword searching. So a couple of the, the use cases that I think of, and, and before I go into the, the actual technical details, but um, number one is around anti-bribery, anti-corruption. So um, there, for healthcare manufact manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies, they have a compliance called the Sunshine Act, which means that they need to disclose any of the payments and, 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 and things that they give and offer to physicians uh, because that's potentially you know, construed as bribery. Um, and so looking for keywords that would identify things of value that might be going to physicians and so forth is another use of keyword search, as well as just general anti-bribery, anti-corruption for um, uh, an analysis as well. I've got a couple questions around whether or not we have a keyword list and or scripts. Uh, we're going to talk about that later on in the presentation. I'll show you a bit of a demo on that. But yeah, definitely something to, to follow up on as well. Uh, when it comes to keyword searching, there are a couple of things that you want to consider um, from a technical perspective. Uh, number one is this concept called uh, lemmatization. Um, so if you have a, a word like, oh, the other thing I want to mention here is, well, actually, let's, let's finish off the lemmatization thought first. Uh, if you have a word like storing, you might, you'll want to convert that to store. So then you have, um, you have a consistency set, a consistent set of keywords, unless you want to have like five different ways of tracking every single word combination. So that concept um, in data science is called lemmatization. And there's definitely Python scripts out there. And this is something that we're planning on adding to um, ACL robotics as a, as a core functionality in the future. But uh, lemmatization for keywords is one thing you want to consider. Uh, another thing you want to consider is that when you have multiple keywords and multiple hits, uh, how do you handle that? So um, if you have uh, a line that says tuition and bribery, what do you what do you do with that scenario and and how do you how do you report it um and of course the bribery and corruption use cases uh language and translation is another um consideration that has been uh raised as concerns uh there are open sourced um you know google and and, and others uh offer up some of their translation services you can either hit them via api um or uh, via that, you know, there's some libraries that you can pull in and, 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 and integrate with. Uh, that's also another area that we're looking at expanding ACL robotics into to automatically do some level of language and translation for you. Of course, not going to be perfect. So um, there's, there's that challenge. Um, but Frank, anything else to add to this uh, keyword matching thing before we move on? No, I think we can move on. Cool. Okay, so kickbacks. This has been, uh, especially in the present economic climate, more and more pressure, obviously, uh, uh, to, to do this. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of people are, are being pushed to the, the edge with their, their mortgage payments or, uh, or, or, or otherwise to, to, to do this more. Um, but it's also very, very difficult to find. Uh, here's a scenario where uh, last year we were working with an organization and they found that where there was a maintenance manager that was colluding with um, I, I don't remember if it was a fictitious vendor or if it was a real vendor, but the vendor was sending them fictitious invoices and the maintenance manager was approving them and he was getting a, a kickback from approving those invoices. Um, this had been going on for years. So there was a tune of $3.6 million in fraud um, and it was found within you know, running at the first few months of the, the analytics. And how we found it was using Benford's Law. And most of the folks on this call here today should be aware of Benford's Law, but if you just needed a quick reminder, um, essentially Benford's Law tells you that in a natural set data set of numbers, you're going to have um, a certain frequency of the starting leading digits um, that is not uniform throughout. So the lower digits like ones and twos are gonna be actually more frequent as a leading digit than eights and nines. Um, and so what you can do is any audit, audit analytics software, you can just essentially run this in a couple of clicks, but you get a graph like this that shows you where the peaks are um, and what the expected curve is. So this is what a typical expected curve is. And then you can see, okay, well, uh, there was a lot more invoices at this number, a lot more invoices at that number. And then you'll want to drill into those peaks 
to see where you have um, what's causing those peaks essentially. Does that make sense, Frank? Yeah, certainly. It's just one of the simplest rules and one of the very effective um, applications of, of data analytics. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just, it takes two seconds to do and just raises so many um, good places to start looking. It doesn't get you, and I'll show you some examples just in a bit, bit but the general um, approach that we rec would recommend is to apply Benford to two digits um, and then you can select the digit sets that have the out of bounds frequencies. And then for those digit sets, go back to your original data set and pull out, say, the top three vendors that had the most uh, invoices with those starting digits. So here's an example here. Leading digit of 24 was flagged as a spike on that Benford's Law chart. The expected number of invoices was 157. We had 296, so almost twice as many. And then we picked out the top three vendors that had the most invoices with that transaction amount. Now, you can take a look and say, okay, well, there's probably not fraud here going on because A, the, the most number of invoices any particular vendor had was four. And then secondly, um, 24 probably means that there is some sort of limit signing authority at $25,000. And what the scenario here is that they're splitting the invoices and splitting the payments up so that they can get it under their signing authority, which is a control issue in and of itself, but not necessarily fraud, right, Frank? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, realistically, that becomes, we go back to internal controls again, and, you know, you may be getting somebody in trouble internally because they're splitting payments, which happens, again, almost at every organization, but it would eliminate that, that thought of fraud. Yeah. Now, here's a, a more, um, you know, it's something that's worth a little bit more uh, digging into. The leading digit with 12. So there probably isn't a signing limit at thirteen thousand um, dollars, and also in this case, the 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 vendor that had the most was eight um, transactions at twelve thousand some dollars um, for hardware manufacturing. And you can also see that the timelines of when these invoices were coming in is roughly a, you know very very frequent and uh, at particular times. So this is worth additional scrutiny and and looking into, of course. Um, and by the way, this is real. Uh, real data from the U.S. government uh, from a U.S. government agency um, that's being posted online and available for anyone to look at for transparency's sake. So this is real. It's not fake data. This is real live data, and this this shows you a, a representative example of what you might find when you run Benford's law. And and real quick, something else. Uh, you know, again, it, outside of it necessarily being a fraud um, item, what it could show you is another opportunity for for um, improvement where this could all be legit. And what you might find is we're paying all these invoices and maybe it's a centralized paying, but it's coming from multiple locations. It might be an opportunity to, uh, to bring all that ordering together and get better pricing and different things like that. So when we talk about leakage, there's so much that comes out of these, the data that you get, so. Yeah, the optimization piece here is, is another angle at it. So yeah, instead of having eight invoices, at twelve thousand dollars each, I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could talk, call, call up this vendor and say, "Hey, we're 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 doing so much business with you. Let's build out a pl blanket PO and 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 blanket invoicing so that we can get and maybe get better rates." Right? Exactly. So there's there's definitely money to be saved in in that angle as well. Cool. So that's kickbacks and Benford's laws. Great, great use. And and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the scripts in in a little bit. I'm going to a couple of questions on that. Um, but yeah, moving on to to software licensing. Uh, briefly, what, what do we mean by um, software licensing um, audits here, Frank? So yeah, Phil, I'll, I'll go quickly as we thought we're, we're already getting uh, a little far here. So I'm going to try and go real quick here. Um, software licensing is one of, the, uh, one of the areas that is real high dollars. It's not high volume, it's high dollars and worth a look and I'll give you an explanation. So what we're trying to do is understand license counts versus usage. So basically what it allows you to determine is if, if you're over licensed or under licensed uh, within a particular software service. And if you're over licensed, obviously you are under licensed. Let me go there. If you're under licensed and you get audited by the uh, software vendor, you're going to owe 
uh, penalties and fines. And plus, as long as you've been doing it, it's not like you just pay them for the month they find it. If you've been under license for three years, you go back and you pay for that. And so we just did a, um, a very large clothing manufacturer and found that they were under license to IBM for the last three and a half years for the tune of $15 million. And what we were able to do is obviously by the number of licenses and how, how they were using them and how much they were using their, concur their um, uh, concurrent licenses, came up with the number, they agreed. But what we were able to do is go to the vendor then. Instead of them getting audited and the vendor coming to them, we went to the vendor, we're able to bring that down from $15 million to $8 million, $7 million of savings by being proactive and, uh, and renegotiating that to get them up to where they needed to be in good faith. Um, so that alone, obviously, is worth <laughs> quite a bit. Um, but then you get the over-licensing side. And, and what's near and dear to my heart is the leakage and optimization. There's so much of it available in every organization we do work for. How many companies, and I, and I don't want to use Salesforce as a an example because it's an amazingly great company, but it seems like every organization we go to has way more Salesforce licenses than they use. And it's, everyone's got these grandiose ideas of, of their CRM, but, but half the people don't use them. And I know uh, an organization that had like a thousand Salesforce uh, individual user licenses. When we ran it through analytics and usage, we determined they needed 200 concurrent licenses and 100 individual licenses, which saved them. I mean, it was literally like a 60% savings and did everything they needed to do. Um, and it was just by a simple use of analytics and usage um, through algorithms of usage. Yeah, and by the way, we have a Salesforce connector built right into robotics and, and ACL analytics so that you can connect to the Salesforce data directly and, and, and pull that. Um, so just, just in case you weren't aware, we have that um, as part of the, the software suite. Um, and, and that under licensing thing, of course, it's always better to, to come, um, come to the table and, and seek amnesty rather than being caught ready. Yeah. Like and, and real quick, one more note on that too, is what happens a lot. It doesn't have to be the huge or the huge, uh, software vendors. What happens a lot, is, especially if you're like Cebus, for instance, we have offices in every, uh, city, right? We've got, but you know, the, the Kansas city offices is a construction audit business. And then you go to our New York office is big into retail and, and, uh, and fashion design clients. And, you know, and then you have every place has a different software that they need to help their clients best. And what happens is, is they get lost in translation. But when you run all of this through, you start realizing in aggregate again it's it's like me overpaying for my my uh insurance on that uh, phone it's only 15 dollars to me but if there was a thousand uh people that we we're doing phones for it'd be fifteen thousand bucks every month you know so it's the same kind of thought concept and it's leakage and leakage and leakage and leakage which builds up so great um and yeah speaking about uh the pricing and 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 savings uh the last uh, item here that we're going to, last way that we're going to talk about is around finding pricing outliers and, and outliers in general. Um, and so when, when I was uh, working as a consultant to work with a hospital um, or healthcare provider and uh, they ran, you know, they, they obviously did a lot of, of purchasing of supplies and, and medical equipment. Um, and what happened was we, we ran through their, their, their purchases through, the analytics, um, and we looked at the, the 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 price they were paying per unit, and we saw there was a big jump for one of the the items that uh, they were paying the, the the supplies that they were paying for. One week it was one price, and the next week it was two and a half times the unit price. Well, what happened? Well, the supplier changed the number of units per box. The price didn't necessarily change, or they they didn't change the price on the, on the contract, and then ultimately they were paying two and a half times more per unit. So mm -hmm. that can happen, and, and and very easily slip through the cracks because no one no one's paying attention to that level of of detail. And um, yeah, other other supplies and suppliers they they noticed they were paying um, they had multiple suppliers and they were paying one price with one supplier and then forty percent more with another supplier. And so having this kind of analysis um, outlier analysis per um, either uh, per, per item or per vendor can get you to identify these, these scenarios. Mm -hmm. So what do we mean by outlier analysis? Um, well, 
if you take your your pricing and or invoices for a particular vendor, um, they're going to come in in some sort of distribution. So you're going to have a little bit more on some days, a little bit less some days. But when what, what you can do is you can a have uh, an analytic where you find the middle point. You can find how wide this this bell curve is by calculating the standard deviation. And then you create a bounds. So maybe two or three times the standard deviation is what you want to consider as an outlier. Um, and then you would find any of the transactions that sit outside of those upper and lower bounds. Uh, luckily, we have a command in ACL analytics and, and, and robotics that does this automatically. So you just have a set of data and you select, okay, well, I want to find outliers and put in the amount field and which field you want to bucket off of, and then you'll, it'll identify any of the transactions that are outside of bounds. So this is uh, a representative example of what you would get out of an outlier analysis um, approach. So I ran through all of the invoices um, in the data set. And uh, for example, Philips North America, the median invoice, uh, there were eight invoices. The median invoice amount was $17,000. Uh, but there was one invoice that was to the tune of what, $646 million. Uh, of course, this is a government agency, government contract, and maybe there was a, uh, an emergency going on considering the, the timing. But um, you know that's that's the kind of thing where you know, you know it, you can have the analytics flag these types of transactions for you to to do further due diligence and scrutiny over. Does that make sense, Frank? Sure does. And and again, uh, you know, internal controls, which is my life. That is the point of a lot of this is to get sign off on these anomalies. So when your auditor comes through you've already done the analysis on this and that's the prudent financial monthly financial review that that uh, shows you know your your precision in, in what you're doing and your controls yep speaking of uh, external audit of course Deloitte shows up here interestingly enough so, so that's <laughs> an interesting uh, item there great so we've gone through the five different ways uh, well at least five different ways and there's you know like you were saying Frank we could go all day talking about this stuff um, but maybe a question to the audience. Um, what is the way that you would think that you're going to find most likely to find cash fast in your organization, whether it's duplicate payments or freight or kickbacks and fraud or software licensing um, and, and really contribute to, um, to, to finding that and addressing that, that leakage. Great. Uh, so I'm going to switch over a little bit to a demo um, of um, you know, what, what, do, what does a program look like? And uh, maybe I'll bring up the storyboard first. So uh, we've got a set of scripts that, uh, that we've, we've built out called the cost control quick start, which addresses uh, a few of these different areas. And as part of the cost control quick start program, um, you know, it comes with a, a, a storyboard, uh, which shows you both the, 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 the trend of duplicate invoices that you found at a high level, um, what the status is of the recoveries, um, and then what is contributing, what tests are contributing to finding those duplicate invoices. So for example, um, here we've got a, a bunch of invoices that were found with the same vendor, um, with similar, same, similar but different vendor invoice numbers. So I know there was a question that came in about how do you, well, how do you find same, similar but different invoice numbers? Um, what you can do is you can use uh, the ACL analytics um, include um, function to create a computed field. And when you, what you put in that include function is the numbers and letters. And that way you'll clean out any of the periods and dashes and apostrophes um, and really just get the alphanumeric um, or even just the numeric portion of your invoice number and compare that against um, the other invoice numbers. So that would be the way that I would recommend doing a, a, a fuzzy duplicate invoice number check. And, and I'd say, Phil, for those that are, um, that would push this information up, we did a um, poll amongst all of our analytics clients, or yeah, our clients, and over 90% said they would prefer to get the results in a storyboard than in a report, which I thought was very interesting, which tells me the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, stands uh, tall right there. Um, the visualization piece of it is what clients seem to want. 
everyone's in a hurry. They want to see it quickly. And if they, something catches their eye, they want to be able to drill down, which this does brilliantly and takes you just to the data you're interested in where you don't have to uh, finger through a million different lines of data. So that is something that's really important, especially if someone on this call would be pushing this up to managers, senior managers, and even C-suite. Yeah, exactly. It's a great way to present your data to, to senior senior managers and, and senior executives, as well as say your audit committee or your, your board as well. As a, uh, We use that internally at Galvanize for communicating um, our performance and results and, and, and risks. Um, and of course, you know, here's a, an example of, of a, a heat map of which vendors are contributing to your duplicate invoices the most. And if you're interested in the underlying data, of course, you can click on the button, of course, log in, and, and get at the underlying transactional details. So it's not just the pretty picture, it's also the ability to dr drill into the uh, underlying data. And if you wanted to say filter in for, well, I'm interested in this big, big box here, of course, you can just double click on that and drill into uh, the results. Um, we've got plenty of training, plenty of examples of how to uh, set these, um, these visualizations up. It's very easy. I mean, you've got the data here in results. Um, you can upload them from analytics directly or from an Excel spreadsheet even, and then click on add visualization and, and create your visualizations um, that way. So here are the, the results for those, that particular uh, vendor. Um, so you can you can see what's contributing to that that big square. Um, the other thing that uh, I would also mention from the perspective of this uh, storyboard and and something we haven't talked about till now is as you implement these controls, the idea is that you you start fixing your processes and optimizing so that they don't occur in the future. And that's another area of return that you can um, bring to your business is set up these controls, set up this monitoring, um, and watch the duplicate invoices go down. And had you not implemented these controls, of course, you would expect that line to be flat. And now you've saved millions and millions more dollars because you're preventing them from happening in the first place. That's correct. Cool. So that's just a quick demo. Obviously, if you want to have a deeper dive into this, um, you know, I'm going to have a few calls to action in a little bit, but just to talk a little bit more about the scripts here, um, we've picked out uh, four super easy ways to, well, there's a set of actually 18 analytics altogether, um, but uh, four primary ways. So whether it's duplicate invoices, the keyword um, analysis that we were just talking about, outlier amounts, uh, or even suspicious posting patterns, um, which we didn't go into a whole bunch of detail today, but essentially looks at when you have, say, an AP clerk who both creates a vendor and posts an invoice to that vendor, creating that segregation of duties and identifying when that is not met. So um, the nice thing about these analytics is that you only need one data set, essentially, AP invoices and maybe your vendor information to be able to do this analysis. And you can apply all 18 of these tests. So it's a really quick way to get ROI on an analytics program a great way to demonstrate to your senior leadership that an analytics program is worthwhile. Um, and you can either implement these yourself or, um, you know, of course, you can have folks like Frank or, or, or Galvanize help you with the implementation of uh, these types of analytics. Um, but these, this is definitely where I would, based off of my experience, recommend where you would start um, if you don't have a program set up already. That's right. I would say too, just as in a little bit of a closing on this is, regardless of who you use or how you do it, this is something every organization should should prioritize, which sometimes it seems like they don't. They don't have enough time, don't have enough of uh, uh, staff or whatever, and it is almost foolproof. And I would tell you that just bringing money back to your organization is <laughs> is worth a lot in your career at that organization. So, yeah, that's that's exactly it. Um, so, again, not only just doing the analytics themselves and finding the results, but demonstrating them into a storyboard is a, another key aspect of, of doing a program like this. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a challenge for folks right now is you just don't have time to complete an extensive IT project right now. So what would we say to that? And, and Frank, I'll let you chime in as well, but um, there's a couple of ways around this. One is um, we do have cloud analytics as an approach. So you can upload your data, um, you know, run a report out of your ERP, 
upload your data to cloud robots and run the scripts right there. So you don't have to install a server. You don't have to um, set anything up with IT. Just, just run the data set and, and get your results. Um, so that is one way to get around it. Another is to speak with someone like Frank, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, realistically, everything we've talked about here is something that, you know, a, a, an outsourced firm like us do, does on a contingency. Um, obviously, to take the risk away from your organization uh, where there's not a structured fee. So if we don't find anything, you don't pay anything. But then you also get the uh, the expertise of a practice that does specifically AP or does specifically freight or does specifically software and um, you know, in a lot of, like I said, a lot of ways you get the, the, you pay the percentage, but you get the lion's share of that. And it, it, every organization can't afford to shelf this. It is 99% success rate. That's why I keep uh, stressing this to all my clients. And at this time, when we talk about this, this mar industry or market right now, the environment is just crazy. It's, it's something really positive to do. Yeah, and, and you mentioned contingency. That's definitely one way that can address it if people are budget crunched or, or risk averse um, or cash crunched. Um, we at Galvanize also are going to be offering up um, or are offering up currently um, special payment terms and plans that will allow you to take advantage of this software and functionality now and pay for it later. So essentially, you're going to be able to have this implemented get the recoveries and, and results in, and then use that to turn around and pay for the actual solution. We're, we're that confident that you're going to get the results out of this, that we're, we're happy to extend um, uh, some, some payment terms and, 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 and approaches if, if customers are, and organizations are out there um, in a cash crunch, uh, because we all know that there's, there's challenges in the present economic climate, and one way to address that is with data analytics. So that's a good segue into um, sort of what the, the calls to action are. Chat with your Galvanize rep, chat with me. Feel free to reach out to me um, as well. Frank, you, you've got your email here. Um, right. The other partner that, uh, you know, we haven't mentioned up till now is we're working closely with Donnelly Financial. Um, so I, there might be some folks here on the line who are Donnelly Financial um, customers or, 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 or partners. And so, um, yeah, you can reach out to Donnelly Financial as well. And we work closely with Donnelly Financial, just like we work closely with CBiz and, and many other uh, partner organizations to implement our software. Uh, just going to close out in case there was anyone here from uh, the government uh, organizations, just a, uh, a great case study here around uh, finding these leakages and inefficiencies um, to, uh, for state contracts. So continuous monitoring allowed them to save, you know, almost $3 million worth of vendor overcharges, um, 250K in PCARD errors and fraud, and a bunch of time saved to, with actually managing those vendor reports. Cool. With that said, uh, there's a few questions here. So I thought we'd, uh, we'd tackle them um, with the last 10 minutes. Um, so Audrey asked if there was a script available for identifying those uh, fuzzy duplicate invoice numbers. Yes, there is. Um, that's something that you can speak with both Frank or our galvanized rep to, to get access to. Um, Jolt asked, uh, what would initiate the keyword search for tuition? Uh, nothing. Uh, we actually had tuition as part of our um, standard set of um, keyword list. Um, and there was another question about whether or not we would share that keyword list. Happy to share that keyword list. Uh, with the members and, and folks that are on the line. So that's something that we can reach out to you with. We'll, we'll share the slides as well as the, the keyword list um, um, as part of the outcomes of this uh, conversation. And that goes for um, a similar uh, is expense reporting. There's keyword lists for expense reporting as well. Yep, yep, exactly. And, and, and uh, yeah, so, so definitely a few different sets of keyword lists that, that are, are available. Um, Phil would be onto something if a payment split with if, if they weren't monthly invoices and had very close invoice dates. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, some of them may not may or may not be payment splits, but nonetheless, they're they're probably telling their vendor to stay under a limit. Um, and maybe they're, they're, it's not actually 24k. It should be a little bit more than that. And they 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 tried to get that sneak that under the the limit. And um, so so yeah, they may not be specifically invoice splits, but there's data pointing towards that. Uh, Stephen asked uh, if the expected invoices were the expected invoices in the population based on the Benford two-digit rule. Yes, 
So the, if I go back to the slide with the Benford's Law test, um, let's go back to here. Uh, this expected count is based off of the number of invoices in the um, population. And for this particular leading digit, we expected 307 invoices to occur uh, with that set of leading digits. And the actual number was 441. So we had a significantly more um, number of invoices than, um, than were um, in the leading invoices. Uh, there's a question from Lisa on whether there are any plans to build an in four connector. Uh, we might actually, uh, I, I, need to, I need to review that and see if that's on the list. We, we're expanding our connector list by about 50 new connectors uh, for the end of the year. So um, I'm not sure if that's on the list of 50 connectors, but uh, that's certainly something that we can, um, I can see if that's on the, the list or not. Uh, Elizabeth asks, uh, so mentioned that, hey, I, I mentioned uh, about a Salesforce connector. Do we have a Workday connector? Uh, the answer is, uh, yeah. So um, we actually can connect to Workday directly via API. Um, you have to use the, the Workday uh, reporting as a service approach. Um, we've done this with clients um, and, and it's very successful. Essentially, you go into Workday, you set up a report in the reporting as a service um, option, and then that exposes that report um, to an API, which we can connect to using um, ACL robotics directly. Um, and so that's a, it's a great way to connect directly to Workday and something we've had uh, good success with, with with certain customers. Frank, I don't know if you have any customers on Workday, but be more and more. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and um like, like you said, I mean, it seems like every day you guys are coming out with new connectors. So any major software, is, if, if not already has a connector, I know, and speaking with some of your, your people, that it's on the list. Yep. Um, I guess go back to the questions page here. Um, what was the, the, the question from Alicia was, what was the function in ACL you used to um, identify pricing outliers? It's literally called outliers. So if you go into our help docs and type in outliers, there's a command uh, right in the menu that you click on that says outliers. So it's, it couldn't be easier. Um, Patricia asks, do you have to have a license for everyone who wants to be able to drill into the results? Um, yes, now that type of license uh, can be, uh, doesn't have to be a full license. We have what's called oversight uh, or contributor licenses that you can also set up, which gives people more limited access um, so that you can you can still set up the drill downs even if you don't have a, a full license um, and that's at a different price. So that's something to speak with your galvanized rep about. Elizabeth asks, what products need uh, do you need in order to be able to set up the visualizations being shown? Uh, you don't need anything other than ACL Robotics. Everyone who has ACL Robotics has access to uh, what we call is results. So um, speak to your galvanized rep. They can help you get started on, on how to use it. Um, you don't need anything special. Um, everyone has access to it. You're going to be limited to the number of visualizations and or tables that you can set up, but uh, everyone can get started with those visualizations. Um, Bonita asks, how do you make time for this, especially as audit is very time sensitive and bills client by the hour? Hmm. Um, well, you could call up someone like Frank who can uh, help you get through it and, and make time for you. Um, anything else to add to that, Frank? Yeah, I mean, realistically, you know, any outsourced firm, what, what they just asked was exactly the, always what you hear is you don't have time, we're stuck in month end clothes and all that. Simple fact is, is especially if you're on a contingency, for instance, have a firm come in and do this and in, in the split is much in the advantage of the client. And it's just like you're running a, a, a data analytics team. So there's always time to share when there's money coming back and you don't pay anything if you don't receive any uh, return. So it's pretty cool proof. Risk free. Yep. Contingent, contingency is a, uh, is a pretty, pretty risk free way of doing it. So that, that and I want to, Oh yeah. Yeah. One more quick note on that. Um, for everyone to know, because a lot of a lot of uh, our clients start by saying, you know, how do you guys do this on a contingency? You know, is, you know, is it worth it? The simple fact is, as we've said this whole time, it is nearly foolproof that we're going to get recoveries 
So we wouldn't be in this business, a, a contingency business, if there wasn't uh, revenue for us. So, you know, again, just really uh, pushing our, uh, the people on this call and anybody, there is money in this. You find time because it's, it's definitely a, 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 a revenue stream. Yep, certainly. So that that's definitely speaks volumes to how you're able to to, to address that challenge. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to end with a pretty technical question here uh, from Dominic. Um, do you integrate your projects with certain Python scripts and functions? If so, do you have any examples? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, so we integrate directly with Python and R. Um, and the, the primary example that I would use, or I've got two maybe that I would use, one is um, for web scraping. So Python has a lot of great functions and capabilities for writing scripts to uh, scrape a web page to pull data in that way. So we've used that for things like uh, currency conversion lists and, and other data that's not necessarily available via API. Um, another example, as I mentioned today, is around lemmatization. So being able to take a keyword and shrinking that down to its root um, core word is another great Python uh, functional, functionality and capability that exists that we've integrated with as well in the past. Cool, with that said, I think that's uh, a wrap for today. I, I know there's a few more questions. We'll have to take those offline. Appreciate everyone for their time um, and attention today. Uh, Frank, anything else to add from you? Thanks, and well, no. first of all, thank you for yeah. taking the time to, to, to share your knowledge and experience with the team here. Appreciate it. And thank you, thank you for including me and, and uh, what a great product that uh, Galvanize has put together in robotics. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.